we have this much money that a client has allocated and they're trusting us to spend it intelligently for them. And if that means that sometimes we have to tell them no, then that's fine actually, because we have their best yeah. interests in mind. What's going on, Badger Nation? It's Michael Erickson Fashin, and you are tuned in to the Ad Badger PPC Den podcast, your place for all the tips, tricks, and strategies you need to get the most out of your Amazon advertising. Today, I am joined by one of my favorite people, one of my friends in the industry, Brent from AMZ Pathfinder. And we got a great one for you today. Brent, how are you doing? We've been riffing for the last 45 minutes. We should hit the record <laughs> button. We covered so many topics. What topics did we cover? Oh, man. We covered a lot of things. I was telling you about uh, de-rusting a bike frame. Uh, we talked yes. about The Princess Bride, a classic 80s yes. movie. <laughs> um, yes. You taught me some industry terms I didn't know. So it's really been I did? an educational 45 minutes here. Industry term? that I taught. What was that? That was uh, peak season, shoulder season. That'll come up ah, later. Yes. Mm -hmm. That will come up later. We're going to save that one for you today. <laughs> uh, you got a new computer. You got a Mac Mini. We talked about that. Very exciting. Yeah. You know, a, a, a desktop person. Uh, you know, it's a real lifestyle change. Yeah. I, I've become a desktop person now. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's like maybe it was about time after a full year of, uh, you know, uh, confinement, reconfinement, unconfinement here in France. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the, the time has come and yeah, this thing's, this thing's chugging along. It's wonderful. It makes absolutely no noise. <laughs> you know how there's a lot of gurus that say like, work from your laptop, from a beach, somewhere, anywhere. And like, <laughs> I think it'd be really funny to be like, bring your desktop to the beach. And like you set up an entire desk, you have your big monitors. That's the life I'm trying to live. <laughs> Well, back when CRTs were the thing, they had briefcase computers. And I remember seeing a, a portfolio or some kind of foldout from an 80s computer magazine years ago. And they had like the IT guy uh, poolside, you know, he's, he's working remotely. You know, we think digital nomads are a hot thing now. Well, pe people in the 80s were doing that. You know, Brent, we have a lot of Gen Z that listen to the show. <laughs> what are CRTs? What if, what if we don't know what those are? Ah, okay. It's a cathode ray tube. It's basically the technology that um, used to be used for displays and it's the really fat, thick monitors. You know, everyone now is used to LCD or LED. And uh, yeah, it's just basically a, an old school TV that was used as a computer. It's the same technology. It projects the image and then there's these, um, I think it's actually like some kind of filament on the screen. And uh, they had a warm up, which was always fun because sometimes yeah. the old ones that are really big, uh, you turn them on, they go, boom, wow. <laughs> I, I was going to say, really satisfying <laughs> sounds, especially when you turn it off too, it goes, <laughs> like makes you, you know that it's off. Yeah. And they consumed probably a, a tremendous amount of electricity compared to displays we have now. <laughs> I only mine my Bitcoin using CRT monitors because I need to get the, mo the more energy you put into it, the more uh, bits you get. Is that how it works? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's it. Scientifically proven, my friend. I, I got that tip from Elon. We hang out. Well, that's good to know. You know, I bet Elon, uh, another thing he would tell you if, if he uh, if he was here, he'd say, if you want to find a CRT monitor, go to your local Goodwill. You can find one for $5. Would he say that? Yeah, he'd say that. He'd recommend that you go get more. That's how you get more Bitcoin is you already have you already positive. That's actually I, that's how I actually met him at a Goodwill, <laughs> buying a CRT monitor. <laughs> uh, anyway, today, as, you, as, as we get into it, um, staying up late, watching Princess Bride on the Netflix share feature. <laughs> uh, as we did because we watched it last night uh, we're kidding that didn't happen <laughs> or did it who knows anyway we have a topic today let's actually get to the good stuff let's get a to the Amazon topic. PPC this yeah. is a serious show where we touch on Amazon advertising technique and strategies to push it to the limit seasonality is the topic that we're talking about today mm -hmm. and I think seasonality we're coming into summer. Conversely, you can be a very heavy Q4 seasonal. And I think the thing that we wanted to touch on, which hasn't been talked about on this show yet, is how do you approach peak season, you know, the quarter, the several months that you are peaking, potentially even um, week, you know, you could be a very heavy Father's Day product or Mother's Day product or whatever kind of product. So whether it be the quarter, the month, the week, 
uh, however you set up your seasonal company, uh, how do you capitalize on that during peak season? How do you capitalize on it during off season? Mm -hmm. uh, what kinds of things should you do? And then, of course, the in between season, uh, shoulder season. What kinds of things do you do there to be sure that you're not spending too much, not spending too little? Make sure you're not bidding too much, bidding too little. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and this was a topic actually you brought up, Brent. So you've got some clients transitioning into peak season right now, mm -hmm. going into the summer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, without getting too specific, there's several that are having um, you know, increased sales exposure at this time of year. And they made us aware of that, uh, I think, a couple of months in advance or when we first started working with them, which was maybe like, mm -hmm. you know, late last year or uh, just recently this year, if, if they're fairly new to, the, to our work and our agency. Um, and I think that is a, a good thing for clients to to you know, let us know about on the agency side or the consultant side or the freelancer side is like, yeah, when is seasonality? And your agency should also ask you that if you don't tell them um, because they mm -hmm. need to be thinking ahead and preparing for that. And we're recording this, um, not to blow our cover here, but pretty close to Mother's Day, right? In the US at least. So that is definitely one of these you know, buying holidays that has a seasonal peak for some of our client businesses, uh, not like tons mm -hmm. of them, but some of them. Uh, and just in general, you know, there's a lot of commerce going around that, that time of year. Yeah, big time. We just had a client write in, uh, she wanted to get uh, some some things done in preparation for Mother's Day. And then when it, once it was humming along, she's like, don't touch it. It's Mother's Day. Let's leave it <laughs> steady. So, you know, there, I have some different thoughts on, on that. I know you do too. Uh, and without further ado, let's actually talk about what you should be doing with your campaigns during any kind of seasonality, whether it be Q4, summer, a month, a week, a holiday. Let's jump into it. Okay, Brent. So, Take us into your thought process. Like there's a lot of different ways that you could approach seasonality. Yeah, I think the best way that we deal with it is to first have that understanding from the client of when it might kick in. And if they have Amazon sales data from the previous year for the same products, that's super, super helpful, right? That gives mm -hmm. us a great preview of what might happen. Now, is the seasonality bound to the weather or is it bound to some other hard fixed date? Because if it's like a fixed date, that's a bit easier. If it's the weather, that's a bit more open to interpretation because weather obviously changes all the time. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we can't say, hey, May 5th, it really was the time when uh, last year this kicked in. Well, that's just because we had a really sunny week and then the following subsequent weeks were really sunny as well. But maybe this May it's all rainy and it's not so nice. So those mm -hmm. are things to be aware of. And then as far as like structure goes, this is one thing I think we can, we can riff back and forth, forth on here a lot, Mike, is like, do we have specific campaigns that are designed to tackle this seasonality or do we have keywords or targets in our campaigns that are already ready to be you know part of that seasonality and we can increase those there or is it a mixture of both because this is you know one of the questions I, I brought to you here you know, I think we struggle with mm -hmm. I think what's cool about being PPCers and being optimized, optimization focused is like you start to see, you know, the almost like an ethernet cord where it looks like one cord, but then, you know, you take a cross section of that and you see all these different threads and you're able to sort of pull on these different threads. So even within the realm of seasonality, you have different kinds of seasonality, which I think mm -hmm. is really worth mentioning. You know, you have some kinds of seasonality, which sort of gradually goes up and then gradually comes down. You know, take um, one product I just purchased were trail running shoes um, to do more outdoor running. Generally, that's much more popular in the summer months and then becomes much less popular in the winter months. Uh, like I purchased it early spring. I'm in Austin. It started getting warmer. It's already in the 80s and 90s uh, Fahrenheit. So it's already started getting warm for a couple of months. I bought these probably about two months ago. So, you know, I bought it during this softer season and now probably the weather's like perfect every day. Now is probably, you know, peak season, if not there for this part of the country. Other parts, probably they're a couple months behind in terms of their temperature uh, and don't have consistent high temperatures. So I think there's gradual ramp ups, it's gradual ramps down. And there's probably also very significant seasonality events like a holiday uh, or even a product that is not even usable 
for, you know, 80% of the population during certain times, like maybe you're selling beach chairs like where, you know, your sales drop to, you know, a 10th of what they normally do during December. So I think that's an interesting consideration there of like what kind of seasonality you're dealing with. Um, I'm inclined to say during those very sharp drop-offs where it's just like, Hey, you know, uh, there's no way anyone's going to buy a mother's day product in, you know, not in May, uh, or April. So we're just going to completely turn off that campaign. It's not even worth entertaining, uh, over there. Mm -hmm. So I have some thoughts about that. So what are your thoughts on that? Of like, should you shut off that like hyper seasonal, like the thing where it just completely drops off a cliff? Should you shut that off or should you, you know, slowly phase it out? What are your thoughts on that? For things that are hyper seasonal, I think it is appropriate to shut it off somewhat abruptly. Uh, let's take the Mother's Day example. It doesn't make a lot of sense to be bidding on Mother's Day stuff in the week following the event itself. It's really those several weeks leading up to it. Mm -hmm. um, another example I'll give that's drawn from my own direct experience would be, um, let's just say like candy and chocolates. So we have a client that mm -hmm. that has, you know, seasonally has those kind of things. And um, certain holidays around quarter four and even into quarter one, um, let's just say Thanksgiving is a good example. So they have some products that are really geared towards Thanksgiving and people might not be buying those anymore um, because Thanksgiving has passed, which for those of you who are outside of the US would be late November, um, you know, that that's over, that's done. However, people might still be buying those candies because they just want to eat candies. <laughs> so, um, you know, we had still uh, sale, sales volume and, and clicks and everything on those because they were kind of like at a discount even. You know, you can find these kind of things like for cheaper in stores. You often see that around quarter four, like, hey, we're trying to get rid of this Halloween candy or this like Thanksgiving treats. Um, so that might be a reason to still keep those running, but then you need to appropriately adjust the bids in your targeting set up for that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's pay-per-click bidding. So if you have a hyper-seasonal, you know, if you have a seasonal product, theoretically, you're not losing anything by continuing to bid on it if nobody searches for it. Um, it's not, then when someone does search that, you know, let's take Easter, for example, and somebody wants to buy a chocolate rabbit in December for whatever reason, um, you know, they want to do that. There's an argument for, well, why wouldn't you want to be bidding on that if somebody searches a chocolate rabbit any time of the year? Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, leaving a keyword like that? Uh, and, you know, I'll preface this by saying, obviously, you need good campaign structure. You need to know where that product is. Uh, you need like spe the specificity of your chocolate rabbit, you know, <laughs> auto campaign, manual campaign. Um, but what are your thoughts on leaving that running year round to capture anytime somebody does search for a chocolate rabbit? Um, I think that's, no, like, I think that's yeah. fine. And, and don't, you know, there's no reason to negate it necessarily. And, and uh, a lot of the listeners may know from personal experience, like going into campaigns and picking through them and removing negatives, you know, archiving negatives can be a really laborious and frustrating process. So mm -hmm. I think manipulating bids is probably the better way to, to deal with that. Um, but mm -hmm. I don't really see a reason why you would explicitly pause them all the way if the value-based bidding is kind of lined up properly. Furthermore, you know, it makes me think of auto campaigns, like they might be uh, a good thing to leave on at a lower bid level or a lower budget level to pick these kind of things up that you can't predict. You know, that's one of the strengths of an auto campaign is you can't foresee all these different things. But if Amazon thinks that that's associated with your product and you've got sales on that in the past organically or through ads, um, you know, you might show up for it in an auto campaign. Yeah. So I agree with that approach for things that have, you know, soft season out, like, obviously peak seasons and then in in some ways like the rest of the year is like a low season not necessarily an off season of just like somebody will search that uh chocolate rabbit and you do want to get in front of there because why wouldn't you and you can capture that and obviously it is you know in that case there's some of the practicality there uh you do want structured campaigns uh, you do want to know like your where your chocolate rabbit campaigns are, but during those times, we need to be thoughtful of what our bidding is doing and what our budgeting is doing. Um, so for those with gradual sloping seasonalities, you 
you know, one thing that I've done in the past is like you're looking at your total sales on Amazon for that product, for that product category. You're looking at that your total sales and then you're looking at that once a week and then you're updating your budgets so that, you know, a lot of people have like 10% of my total uh, revenue should go towards ads. And as that dra- gradually falls during lower seasons, you can go and update your budget. So you're sort of always staying within there. And if you're combining that with, uh, you know, responsive bid optimization, you're able to sort of continue to, you know, you're lowering your bids, you're lowering your budgets as the conversion rate goes down, as the total revenue goes down, you are being responsive to this data. And if you can do that on a weekly basis, you will most likely be aligned with, you know, not spending too much, uh, not bidding too much. Um, so that's my general thought process on there. Um, but I think there's also an interesting point too, which I think you mentioned, uh, which is, you know, you can respond to this data, but I think you can also be proactive on this data as well. You can be a responsive Ronald as well as a proactive, I, I, I almost said proactive princess because we mentioned the princess bride, but you can be a proactive <laughs> Peter. <laughs> proactive Peter, proactive, proactive Paul. Uh, yes. whatever. Yeah. Uh, either one of those, I think it's useful to assign some of these personas a la empire mm-hmm. flippers style, you know, responsive Ronald, proactive Peter. And I would say that some clients will even push you towards being one of those two things was what we've experienced. Yeah. But, um, ultimately we're setting the, uh, tactics and the, in the execution for our clients. And we can push back on some of those things if we feel it's not appropriate, but I think in many cases being a proactive Peter is, is actually fine. You know, you can, it's a bit more of a gamble. It's a bit more of like a wager you're, you're betting on and saying like, okay, we know that in May these sunglasses are going to hit. Like we just know the client has told us uh, we've seen the spend increase for them. We know that let's get ahead of it instead of being responsive yeah. to what we've seen. And similarly with the conversion rate, I mean, that is a, uh, I guess you call that a lagging indicator, right? So you're saying, hey, this is last week's data. We're going to weight it more heavily like you alluded to. Um, but we're still looking at things that have happened already instead of things that are maybe more um, leading indicators like, oh, the click-through rate for this has really been climbing as of late. Um, We've seen a clear trend there. So let's be proactive and boost bids for this and get in front of the demand as best we can and hope that, you know, a lot of the competitors aren't doing the same or aren't doing it as intelligently. Right. Do you have a preference? Like when would you push back from a client who wants to be proactive, you know, they know that historically, you know, May is a time where they're generally ramping up the summertime product. Um, and they just tell you like, Hey, can you push this? Like go, just go in blanket, increase our bids by 20%, uh, increase our budgets by 20% and just go. When would you push back against that? Would you push back against that? Yeah, I think I would because a blanket increase like that, which some clients have heard called like a carpet bombing strategy, pretty violent uh, phrase to use <laughs> for it, but it is definitely like a, um, a very aggressive approach. And they have to understand that there's going to be maybe some performance issues with that in addition to budgetary constraints or concerns. Because mm-hmm. uh, one thing I constantly try to frame with clients or in my own head when I talk to the team is like, we have this much money that a client has allocated and they're trusting us to spend it intelligently for them. And if that means that sometimes we have to tell them no, then that's fine actually, because we have their best yeah. interests in mind. And if we think that you know every keyword that we're increasing by 20% is equally worth the increase of 20%, then that makes sense. But some of them maybe are suitable for 30% and some of them maybe are suitable for five. Some of them yeah. may not be suitable for an increase at all based on um, what we predict to be the seasonal impact there. Yeah. You know, you get, and I also think it's funny that there's so many like aggressive words for PPC stuff. Like let's jack up the bids, carpet bomb the bids, uh, <laughs> slash the budget. Like uh, so many conquesting like, campaigns is one of my favorites. We, we actually name ours that, you know, against competitors. Yeah. Conquest. That's very, Def- yeah. Yeah. Defense offense. Uh, I, we should do an episode on Mortal Kombat characters, but for like Amazon strategy, because it's like, oh, we got to sub, we got to, got to free, got to sub zero these campaigns. It's like, okay, like I'm going into my slow season. I need to sub zero these campaigns. I just saw Mortal Kombat. In case you haven't, haven't realized, <laughs> I have not seen that one. Um, you're missing out, my friend. Oh, okay, um, I'll get into it. Uh, so there is. Yeah, a lot of action words when it comes to PPC. 
But in terms of being able to push back on that and, and be more strategic about where you're increasing and how you're and and how you're increasing, I think like the ultimate way to approach these gradual uh, seasonality is a combination of both being responsive, Ronald, as well as proactive, Peter, because you can anticipate it and you can maybe make micro changes in anticipation of it and be ready to capitalize on it. You also need to be an organized Oliver. Uh, because you need to go in and you need to track these things, right? So if you're looking at your data and you know that, hey, in May, you should be anticipating some kind of bump, uh, then you can set that reminder, you know, the last week of April and start watching it there or the middle of April and start watching it, checking in so that you have the best of both worlds. You're being proactive as well as observing the data and making informed decisions. So I think something like that is exactly where you want to be. Um, so I think it's interesting too, you know, looking at very recent data, comparing that to, you know, trends. So you can, you know, hit the, the time switcher and say, show me, you know, last seven days and then look at your conversion rate, look at your order orders per seven days, and then drag that out to, you know, 30 days and see if you're going up, see if you're good to holding steady um, to help inform you of when it's time to hit the gas uh, and, you know, when that's starting, uh, gun is going off so you don't jump the gun and you're not uh, behind uh, missing out on anything. So yeah, that, that's a little bit of the thoughts on bidding, uh, budgeting. Anything else to add there? You look very pensive right now. Yeah, I was thinking again about this idea of hibernating campaigns. So let's talk about that. Yeah, I think because mm -hmm. I think this is topical with the Badger, right? The Badger's out of hibernation mm -hmm. now. He's back. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. The spring, is, spring is here, so he's, he's awake again. But you mm -hmm. know, hibernation for campaigns is a slightly different idea. And I think this is just speaking anecdotally from my personal experience over some years doing this. Amazon has an understanding of seasonality at some level with. Uh, their advertising and bidding algorithms, and also in the platform in general. This is this is my sense of it. I don't have any evidence from Amazon or like our Amazon rep to like back this up. This is my sense of it. Mm -hmm. And my sense is this: like we have been able to successfully re-enable campaigns that should be coming back into usefulness at a certain time of year, and see them pick up spend and impressions and sales quite quickly. Um, in a yeah. most extreme example, we can go back to that chocolate client where it's like, it's a limited time and then we shut it off. But I can also think of instances we've done this for clients that have a more gradual slope, as you mentioned, like it's a, you know, it's like a bell curve. It's not so much like a cliff um, because everyone who's listening to this has probably experienced this. You, you build a new campaign. It takes some time to get some traction. It takes some time to gather data, to get spend. Uh, we talked about sponsored display a little bit before the call. Uh, you know, in those cases, you can't even get impressions and spend sometimes. It's a bit mysterious and how that works. Mm -hmm. But some of these campaigns that have been put on ice for a long time, maybe it's been a year, maybe it's been 11 months or restarting it. Uh, when we re-enable them, they, they come back to life like surprisingly easily. Uh, and I wonder mm -hmm. if, you know, that that seasonal performance that had happened a year ago somehow figures into that because... Uh, I think that the the more distance a campaign has on its on its performance data, the like the less influence that has uh, in that campaign. So if you if you pause it a week ago and you re-enable it, that's still pretty fresh. But if it's like three four months, I, I would say you know that campaign maybe is not going to be uh, so strongly affected by its recent performance. But maybe there's something that Amazon has in like the year schedule that plays into it. This is you know speculation, but I'm mm -hmm. trying to think out loud on how that how that works. Can I add to that speculation maybe? Oh, please. Yeah, this is a speculation zone right now we're in. <laughs> I, I wonder if part of it is comparative. So like they know that chocolate bunnies, that you know product type, the competitors to that, other companies bidding on that. Mm -hmm. They know that there will be like a decrease in revenue per click, a decrease in conversion rate. And they sort of factor that in. So when you... You know, they know... So like they, they have an idea of like when it's happening, right? Because if... For non-seasonal things, if you have a very, very bad conversion rate, you're going to have a lot of trouble getting traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and like bad, good conversion rate is all about being compared to competitors. Like they know generally like what you should compare, what, what you should be converting at, what rate that should be as well, you know, based off the category that you're in, based off the competing products. Mm -hmm. So if you're a big outlier on that during normal times, you will, you know, be throttled, so to speak. But because it's seasonal, even as your conversion rate goes down during off season, 
so are your competitors. So yeah. being able to turn it back on, uh, going from zero back to something that could be influencing it. Like that, could that zero be impacting it when it was off? But because your competitors were also very low during that time, you turn it back on and it just is able to pick up quicker because relative so you're not that much different than your competition. That's my speculation zone. I think that's really good. Yeah, because then they're looking at the sub node or the subcategory, right? And they're saying like this sub node subcategory at this time is experiencing a general lift. You know, the water's coming in that all the boats are rising simultaneously in this in this mm-hmm. scenario. So it makes sense that if you're in that sub node and you're bidding on similar keywords or targeting, um, they would they would give it some love, you know, so yeah. to speak. One thing we didn't touch on is for the very cliff based seasonality. So holiday based things, mm-hmm. Easter. Uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, your buy your PPC manager a gift day, all these different things. Um, <laughs> for those cliff type events, should someone have a separate campaign purely for, like it could be gifts for mom, right? Gifts for mom could be searched potentially throughout the year, but gifts for Mother's Day, like bidding more aggressively for gifts for mom during Mother's Day time, should those seasonal terms be in their own campaign that you flick on in April in preparation for May's Mother's Day? What are your thoughts on that? I think yes. And the reason why is just for budgeting concerns. Mm -hmm. So if you want to devote a certain amount of your overall budget, yet again, this idea of we have so much money to spend for an account, we want to make intelligent bets. We don't want to put everything on black. You know, we want to say like, we got some on red, some on black. We're playing um, uh, craps here mm-hmm. at the table, right? We're betting on different things. Um, yeah. So we want to diversify our bets and do so intelligently. And if those keywords, which some of them at certain times of year have an absolutely tremendous amount of search volume that comes in like right. a huge wave and then subsides. Uh, we want to, for budgetary reasons, maybe split them out and make sure that they're isolated. We have a clear idea of how much we're spending for those terms during this seasonal kind of like time period, uh, because we don't want that to eat into or chew away at our like uh, tried and true generic category keywords that are running constantly that we're you know hopefully using some kind of software to do bid management with, because that'll throw a wrench in that whole works. Uh, and I think it's probably better to have a separate campaign. Then you get visibility into it too, so you can give it a nice good naming scheme and you can search for it when you go in your account or you look in your reports and you can see everything broken out cleanly in there. That'd be my main argument for it. Couldn't agree more. I think people get into trouble when they have seasonal terms mixed in an ad group with non-seasonal terms um, because these things are competing for similar budgets. Uh, The bid strategy for both the seasonal versus non-seasonal terms should be very, very different. So, you know, like seeing an ad group that's running in, you know, the middle of the summer that says Christmas gifts in it right next to, uh, you know, a topical keyword Mm. for that product. Uh, Not a fan of. Um, So that (laughs) is where the level of segmentation should come in because like the entire strategy should be entirely different for those seasonal terms as opposed to your generic terms. So that's a big thing to think about. Definitely segment those out. Um, So I think if we were to encapsulate everything that we talked about here to bookend this topic. Um, Just to recap that last topic, for very seasonal keywords, those should be in separate campaigns so that you can allocate budget towards it, have a good campaign naming system, an ad group naming system applied to it. Uh, You're able to turn it on and turn it off appropriately. So that makes total sense. Uh, And then what about during, you know, even your generic keywords, during a ramp up time. Um, How can we recap that for people? I think that one's a bit more nuanced because if you have a bidding software in place that's responsive enough to adjust those bids in a a reactive uh, method, then you might not need to have those broken out. I mean, those might be taken care of by software or an intelligent PPC manager Mm -hmm. who's looking over that. Yeah, so just being responsive there rather than uh, having a separate campaign for your generic keywords that are going to run year round. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. What's going to change is their conversion rate, right? That That's what's yeah. going to be the thing that's changing. So mm-hmm. I agree with that. And then in terms of setting budgets, the recap there is look at your total, look at your ACOTS or your 
total ACoS, your ad cost of total sales. Uh, keep an eye on that number to help you determine your budget. And that's where some anticipation can come in too, because if you know you're going into a season, like it's very obvious and overt, you don't want to wait until Mother's Day is over and then look at your revenue and then be like, okay, now let me update my budgets the next week after Mother's Day is over. Mm -hmm. So like there's definitely times where you want to get ahead of that. Um, one topic we didn't touch on, which would be good to finish up with is Amazon doesn't make your year over year data very easy to access. Uh, in fact, they make it quite difficult. Um, could you talk about some thoughts about like what is actually difficult getting some, some of this old data and then some things that you've done to circumvent this issue? Uh, yeah, I mean, what's what's difficult? I mean, if you log into Seller Central and you go to the business reports area, you can see your year over year sales. Anyone listening to this who's a you know account mm -hmm. owner probably knows that and is familiar with that, and that's you know helpful to a certain extent. Uh, yep. But what that's not taking into account is like new products that you've launched since then, and like changes in the competitive landscape. What we don't get, and it'd be super nice now that you mentioned it, Mike, is like if we're in the advertising console interface. We're looking at our ads and we can enable a box that says like this time last year, what was our conversion rate or what was our uh, you know impressions uh, for this time in uh, you know early May or like just before Mother's Day. And that would give us some kind of idea of where we sat last year. We don't have anything like that. So, I mean, I can think of a couple of workarounds. I'll say the one that we do, which is we just have additional software that allows us to see that far back in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where a lot of tools uh, like an ad badger or other ones out there come in because you just, you know, have your data stored in there and you can, if, if the tool is well designed, you can say, all right, let's compare this time frame to this time frame. And that should give you like chain, what they call like change drivers, right? The things that are different between those two time periods. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure how that works in ad badger in particular, but that might be a one way to do it. Another way we do it is we just have archives of client data. It's like, so we download search term reports and we store them in our like secure drive. And then we can say, well, what happened last May? I don't know. Let's go to the search term report and actually look at what happened last May. Mm -hmm. um, the last way we do it is have some kind of data store. Uh, we use something called Tableau actually uh, that we pull in information into. And that's kind of like our database. So we can look at things uh, in this like software and we have uh, data and they're going back to like uh, the beginning of 2018 for most clients. So that gives us a couple Epic. of years. Epic. Yeah. Uh, I don't use Tableau, but the first two uh, are exactly identical. Downloading bulk file backups, downloading the search terms, throwing them in secure drive. Definitely uh, AdBadger does, you know, combine that data so you can do mm -hmm. time comparison analysis just like that. Um, absolutely perfect. And Tableau is just like the visualization of that data. Is that, is that what you were describing? That extra third thing? Yeah, it's a data visualization tool. It's very similar to like a Google Data Studio that other um, agency right. owners that you and I know use heavily, mm -hmm. or there's tools you can use that integrate uh, with Amazon data and connect it to these things. They're called like data connectors. Um, yep. There's a couple other companies I can think of out there that do this, but you know that is something that at the agency level it makes a lot of sense. But if you're you know managing PPC at a big brand, you know talk to your talk to your manager, talk to your boss, and say, hey, we should invest in this kind of stuff. This makes a lot of sense for us to do. It's I would say that right. that's that's better than having search term reports. Although there's no excuse for not having those too, because you can automate the uh, ex ex exporting of reports now through Amazon. Mm -hmm. You can send it to an that's email. Right. You can have it done every month. You know, easy. <laughs> so. Easy. Easy. Just like all things in PPC. Yeah, simple. Um, <laughs> no Brent, gray areas at all. <laughs> There's no gray areas. Everything's very clear cut and straightforward. Yeah. Uh, we could make this episode maybe one or two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? Uh, just play it at double speed, guys. Play it at double speed. I said that slowly. So when you play it at double speed, it sounds like... Well, I, I'm from the New York area, so I do talk... Uh, fast. So if you are listening to this on double speed, it's probably pretty hard to understand. <laughs> Similarly, yeah, I'm East Coaster as well. So uh, fast talker. Mm -hmm, no doubt. Uh, well, if you want more fast talking, please tune in next time. Um, but Brent, thank yes. you so much for coming on the show. I cannot wait to have you back. Uh, Brent, talented PBC manager, agency owner, AMZ Pathfinder. Uh, I don't have a a long list of people that I know so intimately know their skill set, know how they think. Uh, and I think you're one of the best. So it's awesome to have you on the show. And 
NG Pathfinder, Brent, any closing words for Badger Nation out there? I just wonder if everyone enjoys the intro as much as I do. Yeah. <laughs> I, re- I really like the new one. I'm, I'm being dead serious. The the David Attenborough, he's incredible. I, I love his work. He's, so I don't you know how he got him to do it. But. He was hard to get a hold of. Uh, he was in between uh, series. Uh, actually, what it was, he was in, I think it was uh, the Arctic, maybe uh, Greenland or something. And I was there at the same time he was, and I just bumped oh. into him. <laughs> he was like looking at some polar bears. And I was like, hey, can you just like say these words real quick? And um, the rest is history. Now he's on the show. Yeah. Problem solved. Problem solved. Uh, yes, we will be back next week, the PPC Den, solving more PPC problems. And Brent, can't wait to have you back. Have a good one, everybody. And I'll see you next time here in the Badger Den. Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, This message is for those AdBadger customers uh, who want to hear a little bit more about how AdBadger addresses some of the topics in the show. Uh, We don't include this in the main part of the show because we want the show to be able to give you good Amazon PPC Uh, insight, no matter what it is that you're doing, if you're doing it manually inside the console, using another tool, working with an agency uh, or an an agency yourself and have your own systems. Uh, So this message is for those AdBadger customers who are interested in how AdBadger weaves in the time and seasonality uh, uh, that we talked about. So the first thing that we do is we do have responsive bidding. So essentially what that means is we're looking at very short timeframes, you know, like seven days worth of data, and then comparing that to 14, 30, 60 days worth of data, and then tracking, you know, things like conversion rate, revenue per click, the amount of orders. Uh, And then what we're doing with that data is if you're going into a seasonality, we will be able to spot that. So if your seven days is very different than your 60 days, like your conversion rate is much better, your orders per day is much better, your revenue per click is much better, we will start to weigh that data more heavily to try to not only be responsive, but also anticipate that if your last seven days were much different than your 60 days, that means probably the next seven days could be also like trending upwards. So being able to spot those trends, it's a core part of what Bizarre Badger does. Um, and then if you are, if you do have those sort of cliff type seasonality events, that's where you can go in uh, into Bids by Badger and you can either go in and push the bids, push your target ACoS uh, yourself. So you can crank up the target ACoS that will increase the bids. You can also go in and change the bids manually. So if you know that the bid should get closer to, you know, $4 during a seasonal event, you can go in and set it there. And then an ad better will work from there and only change it slightly from that new aggressive bid that you gave it. Uh, so that's one way to interact with it. And then of course, for budgeting concerns, uh, you know, we do save and store your data for as long as you're a customer so that you can view it uh, at any point in time. Uh, it's a big advantage from you know losing that data inside Amazon. So just a quick note for AdBadger customers how to weave this into using AdBadger. If you have any questions, definitely just reach out. Use the chat bubble in the bottom right of our app. And I will see you next time here in the Badger Den. Have a good one, everybody.